How many of you like those uh, crime drama shows? Detectives are out, they're solving cases and stuff like Can I spoil that for you? Well, I'm going to anyways. Um, those shows are not even close to what those people do in real life. My dad worked in the FBI for many years. And because they show, like, you know, that person, they're in the lab, they're doing these exciting, cool tests with, like, beakers and stuff, and then they're, like, solving the case, and then they're, like, going out and kicking down doors and arresting bad guys. Yeah, that doesn't happen. You have, like, one person who sits in a lab all day that doesn't look anything like those very fancy equipment, you know, they have on the shows, and you have, like, somebody else doing a different job and, you know, a different person going and making the arrest. And if that's your perception, of what the job entails, young people, and you like go to college, and you end up in the field, you're going to be very disappointed. But what about when it comes to the role of the pastor? I mean, as far as like movie references go, uh, we get to be the bad guy in Footloose. Um, that's about it. And, and like every so often, like I'll get asked either directly or indirectly, like, what is it exactly that you do all day? Plenty is uh, the simplest answer I can give, but it's important for you to understand what this is supposed to look like. I mean, you guys are a very diverse group of people from a ton of different church backgrounds and experiences. You've had a variety of pastors and leadership styles, some good and some bad. And sometimes people struggle to figure out, like, what category to put the pastor relationship into. Uh, for some people, like are, are, C, are they like CEOs of large companies? Uh, we vote on them. Does that make them like elected officials? For some people, the pastor is like when you're little and the principal of your school was this vague authority figure and you're just hoping you don't get called into his office. And I have to say before I go into this message, I'm not trying to send any kind of subtle message to you or any kind of vague complaint. I'm a happy. You guys are great. In fact, when I find myself around other pastors, I am constantly bragging about you guys. In fact, just at like the, the Mountain Grove camp meeting, I was talking with another pastor, and he told me, he said, I hope you understand what a good thing you've got going with this church that lets you be who you are. If I ever have an issue with you, I promise you, I will tell you directly, either in person or, you know, in a sermon, I'll be very clear, like, if I want you to turn off your notifications for fantasy football during the service, Stephen, I will let you know very clearly. So let's get into the text this morning. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. By the way, next week is the final week. We finally finished this book we've been going through for a long time, and I've enjoyed the journey with you. So here it is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So the first idea there is the fact that pastors labor among you. Now, this in a very literal sense for Paul meant that he was like a co-worker for some of the people there in the congregation. He literally worked with them. But it's also true in the sense that pastors work shoulder to shoulder with everybody else in the work that God has given us. Because sometimes, like in the church, people view it as a massive divide between who gets to stand up here on the stage and who doesn't. And they view, you know, pastors as like these you know, special creatures, and that's just not the case. You know, in Scripture, understand that you are called, all of you, a royal priesthood. That's not just like pastors. That's every follower of Jesus. You are all called saints. It's not just people who live exceptional lives. Uh, I met a, a pastor I'd heard a great deal about, a lot of connections in this area, Gerald Rudd was at the camp meeting. I sat down and talked with him for like two hours. And he told me uh, that he had served at one church for 26 years, and then another church for 18 years, and then retired. 
And, and so for me, whenever I'm sitting with, people, with somebody with that much experience, I ask them, I was like, what advice would you have for me? Young guy, you know, still my first pastorate and learning the ropes. And, and what would you tell me? And the first thing he told me is, love your people. And he said, if you view yourself as better than them, it's going to come out eventually, and it will kill your ministry. Pastors can never view themselves as somehow like superior to the people they work with. It just doesn't work like that. But here's the thing. like The disciples did not have that attitude. In fact, James and John, get this, they had their mom go to Jesus and ask him if they could have the two highest seats of importance in heaven. They didn't even go to him themselves. Like, Mom, you know, go talk to him. And of course that upset the other disciples because they were like secretly hoping that they would get those seats of recognition. And here's how Jesus answered them. But Jesus called to them, this is in Matthew 20, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Now, during this point in history, right, democracy was not really a thing. You basically had everybody who was in a position of authority, uh, unchecked power. You had emperors and kings, and then you had, like, everybody else. And they acted like they knew that nobody could do anything to stop them. They were despots and dictators. And Jesus says, that's what you see in the pagans. We see the same thing today. We've come to expect that people in positions of power treat the people under them in a certain way. Like everybody looks at, oh, Steve Jobs, what a visionary. He gave me my iPhone. But he was a real jerk to work for. He was petty and demanding and overbearing and really just a miserable human being to be around if you were under him. And it's not just the visionaries at the very top. A lot of you, in your workplace, you've experienced this. They give somebody an ounce of authority, right? And then they're setting up a throne in the break room, right? Like, bow before me, peasants. We've been around people who act like that. And Jesus says, it should not be that way. He tells his disciples, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus set the standard for every Christian leader to follow. He didn't commit, come commanding what he rightfully deserved. He came and he washed the disciples' feet. He did the work of of a slave. And this is where we get the phrase servant leadership. That anybody in a position of authority or leadership in the church should have the attitude, not that they're better than anybody else, but they are willing to do the lowest work there is. And so I, I, I suggest that any time at this church or any other church during your lifetime, you have a pastor come in, you know, to candidate at the church, ask him to scrub the toilets on his way out. Or, or something like that. Oh, can you mop up the floors? Just see if there's that willingness there. Because it should be present. Now, hear me though. Jesus was telling the disciples how leaders should act. Their attitude of heart. He wasn't telling us how we should treat leaders. You follow me with that? Just because your pastor, right, has a servant's heart, doesn't mean that you should treat them like a slave. The disciples, after Jesus said this, right, after he washes their feet, they didn't get up after that and be like, oh, well, that's how it's going to be, uh, Jesus, why don't you run and go get me a coffee, right? Uh, you know, no lat, triple cream, extra vegan soy. Is that how people order coffee? So, so they didn't get up and be like, oh, Jesus, now we get to order you around, right, because you're a servant of, of all of us. So more than servants or slaves, the most consistent image given to describe the role of the pastor is that of the shepherd. That's literally what the word pastor means. It's derived from Latin. It means shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5 phrases it this way. It's commanding people, leaders in the church, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, 
as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And again, Peter describes this attitude that leaders should have never treating this like just a nine-to-five job that you clock in and clock out of, but eager and willing service. In pastoral leadership, it begins by example. Because he says, not domineering over people. Jesus said, you know, not lording it over them. Pastors are not dictators. And, and I served for a while, you know, in the military time. A lot of the guys, you know, they come into the church, and they're used to a very strict chain of command. And they're basically looking like, okay, who's going to give me orders? You know, you, you give me orders, and I follow the orders, and I do exactly what you tell me to do. And that, that's not how this works. Sometimes I wish it did. I'll be honest. Like, but th that's not the case, that you do not have one person at the top who tells everybody else what to do. And pastors who act as though that is their job are doing so in direct disobedience to Scripture. And so instead of a lone wolf making all the decisions, here at our church, like most churches, and historically we have a, a pastor and then a leadership team that works with them. And you find that in, in the Bible, in fact, that the role of pastor isn't even very clearly defined when it comes to pastors and elders. And so you have different churches that have different breakdowns of responsibilities. But there is an idea that there's a plur plurality of leaders. And so we have the pastor and then we have the leadership team and we make decisions together. And then we bring the important ones to the church for approval. And one quality I, I really value on people who serve in the leadership team is the ability to tell me no. Pastors need to be told no when they're saying something that's dumb. It happens. I can be wrong. Sometimes even twice a week. <laughs> Ask Sarah. <laughs> so there have absolutely been times, right, where I have wanted to do something or, or sort of thought like, man, this is the way we should go or this is how we should handle the situation. And people on the leadership team have said, I don't think so. Or, or I think we should handle it this way and I've changed my mind. You should never be in a situation where nobody can tell those in the leadership that they disagree with them. Or are made to feel that if disagreeing with leadership is sinful, it is not. Now your attitude of heart might be, the way you handle it might be, but disagreement, it's going to happen. And so I love when people are able to tell me, like, hey, this thing that you're doing, I disagree with it respectfully and in love. Because then we can have a conversation about it. But don't miss this, right? In the same verse, right as he's saying, you know, don't domineer over those, be an example to them. What does he say? He says, exercise oversight. Let me tell you, a pastor that wanders around with the sheep just kind of going wherever, oh, you guys are going over here now, okay, let's go over here. Oh, now we're going to wander over this way. That is not an effective shepherd. He does have a clear job, and it is to lead the flock. So that verse in Thessalonians, he says, look, they labor among you, and they are over you in the Lord. Now, this is hard. Like, I know some of you have been tracking with me until this point, and this idea of somebody being in a position of authority over you, it rubs some people just the wrong way. Pastors are not your employee. I've run into this attitude, not here, but I've run into this attitude before where people in like leadership positions or on boards or whatever, they look at the pastor and they say, look, we hired you and we write the checks and we voted you in and we can vote you out again so you work for us Dance, sermon, monkey, dance. Now really, those people don't have an objection to the idea of somebody being in authority. They just want it to be them. So there is a spiritual authority that is given, not because of personal talent or goodness or character or anything like that, but by God's 
choice. Paul says over and over again, the ministry given to him as an apostle was a gift from God, not anything that he had worked or deserved. Now with the apostles, it's easy to recognize their authority. I mean, these guys walked with Jesus. And so of course they had leadership over the church. But it wasn't just them. Acts 14 describes Paul and Barnabas setting up elders in every church. Paul tells Titus, in every town, set up elders. Leaders with authority are part of God's design for the church. Now, it looks a little bit different in every church, but you're going to have leaders. And so let me ask you, if I am a shepherd, what does that make you? It's hard to spit that word out, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, what did, what did Jesus tell Peter? He says, feed my sheep. Care for them. Now, I understand that like, being a sheep and identifying with that is not really flattering. Sheep, uh, I'll be honest, they're very stupid animals. All right, and so this, I'm not saying anything about you. I'm just saying, like, the sheep need somebody to lead them. And they'll just, like, wander off a cliff. But you're not... <laughs> So understand here. Follow with me. Don't lose me. You are not called to blind, unthinking obedience. But you are called to follow those that God has put in authority over you. So I, I tell leaders, like, you know, sometimes you have people in the church world that think they're a leader, but nobody's following them. You're not leading if nobody's following but if you are in the church and you are never following the lead of anybody else, you're doing it wrong too. Now in the past for me, you know, I've not always been a senior pastor, uh, I understand the difficulty. There have been times when I've expressed to people in leadership and authority over me that I disagreed with the course of action they were taking. And they still did. And I had to just go along with it. Now, look, there, there are times, right, like if, um, you know, I, I come in here and tell the church, like, hey, we're just going to, like, uh, worship Muhammad instead. I do not expect in that situation for you to ever follow a pastor's lead into something that is sinful or rejection of the gospel or, you know, falling down the mission that God has given the church. But you need to be willing to follow pastors as they follow Christ. And it's, it's not just that pastors are over you in the Lord. It says that they admonish you. That word means like to warn, to correct. And already in this letter that Paul writes to the church, he's called them out for their laziness and their gossip and the sexual sins that were among them. So pastors, as part of their ministry, it is to call you out when you're stepping out of line. And sometimes it's in person. Sometimes it's a sermon that feels like it's aimed directly at you. Always in love. My favorite example of this is a confrontation between a pastor by the name of Ambrose and a member of his church, Theodosius. The year is 390 AD, and Theodosius is the emperor of the Roman world. And he goes to Ambrose's church. He's the emperor, unchecked authority. At his word, people live and die. And this is what happens when a riot in Thessalonica led to the death of a government official. Theodosius had a temper, and in a fit of rage, he commands his soldiers, go punish those people. And so they gather them into a coliseum, and they slaughter 7,000 people before he changes his mind to actually don't kill them, and that order gets them, but 7,000 people are already dead. And he shows up at church the next Sunday. And Ambrose goes out and he meets him at the steps of the church. This is the leader of the Roman world. And he denies him entrance. Theodosius says, oh, I'm sorry. Ambrose says, that is not enough. You killed 7,000 people. He barred him from the church for eight months has the emperor wandering around the city, weeping openly and repenting. And then he goes in front of the church, Theodosius, removes his royal robes, kneels, and asks for forgiveness. 
I wish I could have been there to meet. Because here's the thing. Nobody is above God's correction. Not that, you know, the pastor is in a position of worldly authority. He wasn't going and telling Theodosius how to run the empire. But it came to spiritual authority. Nobody is beyond accountability. And that applies to me, too. And this is so important. Oh, man, the headlines recently, I don't know if you follow stuff like this, and the, the revelations coming out of this Me Too movement, and Bill Hybels, a name that I recognize in church leadership, has been removed from authority because he was not held accountable and he stepped into sin. And unfortunately, what happened is that the church leadership did not hold him accountable when they should have, and they dropped the ball. I've read the letter that Ambrose sent Theodosius, and it's touching because it's so personal. He saw him not as an emperor, but a sinner in need of repentance and a person like any other who needed to be confronted. And in it he said, when a priest does not talk to a sinner, then the sinner will die in his sin, and the priest will be guilty because he failed to correct him. So what's your job in all of this? So you follow their lead as they follow Christ. And also in that verse, he says, to respect them and to love them. Now, pastors aren't dictators, but they're also not politicians, right? Because for some people, uh, elected officials exist to give you someone to blame for everything that goes wrong. You might recognize their authority, right, and follow the laws that they create, but there is absolutely, in this country, uh, a, a, like it's a, it's a national pastime to despise those in the highest levels of authority in the country. And yet you're commanded to respect and love your pastors. And, and here's how I'd like you to do that. Love pastors as they are. I'm just some guy. And sometimes this job is terrifying because I'm put in situations that I have no idea what to do in. Just be honest with you. Man, my first day of ministry, I went in and I sat down at a desk, my own desk, for the first time in my life and immediately panicked because I knew that people would be looking to me to decide what to do. And I knew that at some point I'd mess it up. Pastors are in need, not just of your love and respect, they need your forgiveness. I've come to some of you in my time here and had to ask your forgiveness. Let them be human. Let their family be human. My wife, my kids, they are not perfect. Right? Sarah did not marry me thinking she was going to be a pastor's wife. My kids were not called to be pastors themselves. All right? This past Wednesday, right during worship practice, Mitchell came up and peed at the altar, okay? <laughs> Stuff like that happens. <laughs> All right, yesterday, Christine pitched an ever-loving fit at Mark and Sheila's house. All right, I was glad that happened. You gotta understand, my kids, the little sinners. They are, like all of us, and they need God's grace. So I'm pleading with you for myself and other people in ministry. Treat them like any other kid. Don't ever tell them you shouldn't do that because you're the pastor's kid. Don't ever put that level of expectation on them. That you've got to be at everything. You've got to meet the standard of perfection. And I'm preaching to myself as well because I've done that before. I've placed expectations on my family that I shouldn't have. So now that we all have flaws and the pastor can't be good at everything, Okay, you're, you're under somebody who's good at some stuff, and every pastor is different. Every pastor is unique in their ministry. And they're going to have stuff that they excel at. My artistic ability. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and, so like, and then they're going to have stuff that they're not so good at. And let me tell you, Miss Donnell and my wife both cover for me so much when it comes to areas of administrative uh, work, okay? Because they understand that, like, I'm gifted in some areas, man, like, sometimes my memory on, like, routine details or just remembering to do routine things, it, it's really not great. 
And so they've been great at, at coming around to me and supporting me in that. First uh, Timothy uh, 5, uh, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, again, this doesn't mean that like I expect you to like, you know, bow before me or anything like that. But what better way to honor your pastor and let him know that you appreciate him by buying him a 13 millimeter Inzer power lifting belt in navy blue available on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, you don't have to do that. I mean, you could also get him tickets to the Dallas Redskins game that's being played on his birthday in Dallas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But seriously, st stuff like that. Now, this church does stuff like that. And it's, you know, when you guys, like, bought me a TV, right, like, two years ago, um, that, that's crazy. You guys are awesome. But honoring your pastor doesn't look like that. I mean, just as, as awesome as that is the fact that Miss Kathy gives me eggs like every two weeks, keeps me well supplied on my training diet. Many times it's a word of encouragement. But really, you know what like, the biggest thing you can do? Be at peace among yourselves. Every minister I've ever talked to, right, they go into ministry because they want to preach the gospel, not because they want to referee church fights. <laughs> That's the truth. And the, the most, like, discouraging thing for a pastor is to have his time wrapped up with stupid side issues. And let me just tell you, again, you guys have been great at this. I get to preach the gospel. I get to go and pour into people's lives, and I've not spent a tremendous amount of time since I've been here putting out fires, and I appreciate that. And that's why Paul commands this church, esteem them highly in love, and also be at peace among yourselves. And also here are the next verse as well. And we urge you, brothers, now catch this, because this is all together. So he says, respect these pastors, esteem them highly in love, and he says, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. He's describing the church sharing the work of ministry. It is not just up to one person to do all the work in the church. You will burn people out like that. We're all in this together. Now, earlier, again, Paul himself had warned people who were lazy among them. And it's not just that he did it, and it's not just that the pastor should say something. He's writing generally to the congregation. You are to hold each other accountable for your work ethic. And sometimes this happens. You know, people, they go to the pastor, 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 that person's sinning. What are you going to do about it? That happens. Well, Christine's doing that at kindergarten a little bit. You drew out my paper Teacher, teacher. Sometimes it is the role of the church. You have a relationship with someone. You have that connection. Because let me tell you, it is a difficult thing to receive correction from somebody else. There are going to be times when I'm going to look at you and be like, look, you need to talk to that person. That person has sinned against you. You need to go and talk to them. He also says, encourage the faint-hearted. I think of those of you who have sponsored, like, kids to go to church camp or women for CWC trips. Encourage people. If you see a new face in the church, go and talk to them. Don't let me be the only person that welcomes somebody into this building and into this group. He says, help those who are struggling. And I give my number out to everybody and tell them, call me if you need anything. Give them your number. Now, this church, you know, build, be built up together. Healthy churches grow pastors. I have been so blessed. Both churches I have served at have been incredibly healthy in most of the stuff I just talked about. And that is just let me do everything that God has called me to do. So again, thank you. I encourage you to continue and, and do this kind of thing even more. And I understand as well that there may be somebody, as I'm speaking today, that God is going to call into ministry. I was sitting in a congregation during a sermon like this when God first began to stir that in my heart. 
And so it'd be so incredible if God raised up somebody like that in this church. But not everybody's called into pastoral ministry. And sometimes people who make the biggest impact in the church, they fill the role of being a support. They show up on time. They are prepared to serve. They go and they say, where can I do something? They do things without even being asked. Most people make the church awesome. Pastors are going to come and go. Some of y'all have been in this church for years and years and years. You have poured sweat and blood and tears and time into the ministry here. And everything that happens, right, these baptisms we're about to do, that has as much to do with you as it does to do with the person who gets to die. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the leaders that you've placed in our lives. As we grow up under the authority of our parents and it's their job to raise us up in your ways, but also, God, as we go into the church, help us to have the proper attitude towards servant leadership. That those who are in positions of authority would live godly lives above reproach, leading by example with humility of mind, willing to serve. Pray that you would help us to follow those that you've put in authority over us. That we are able to voice our opinion with love and respect, to follow their lead, to pray for them and encourage them, that together we can do everything that you've called us to do as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.